name is Joseph Markowski. The last name is spelled M-A-R-K-O-W-S-K-I. Okay. My name is Michael Zippert, Z-I-P-P-E-R-T. Okay, and uh, which ship were you? USS like? Warrington. Or USS Warrington, DD-843. Thank you. And uh, when were you on board? I was on board. I arrived on board May of 71, and with her through decommissioning of September 30th, 1972, the day I turned 21. And? I was on, on board uh, May of 1972, and it was decommissioned uh, September 1972. So I'm sorry, are you guys were you shipmates and brothers or no, shipmates. Just shipmates? shipmates? Okay, shipmates. thank you. Yeah. Um, so where and where uh, where were you born and raised? Okay, I was born in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, so coal mining country of northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, graduated high school in 1969, moved to upstate New York to take a, a job as an apprentice electrician. Got my draft notice and joined the Navy in September of 1970 and went to Great Lakes uh, Boot Camp, uh, completed boot camp December of 1970, and was sent back to Great Lakes in January of 1971 to attend Boilerman Class A school. Um, completed school in late April, early May, and was then assigned to Warrington out of Newport, Rhode Island. Thank you. And I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, uh, joined the Navy in um, November of 71 and got out of A school somewhere in, in February of 72, got on board the uh, Warrington. And so what made you join the Navy then was, because you had I, just mentioned the whole, the drafting thing. Yeah. I got my draft number and it was extremely low and I joined the Navy. So. Okay. Mine was seven. <laughs> Mine was like 10 or 11. <laughs> I've never played that number since. <laughs> um, okay, why, well, why did you go into the Navy then? What made you pick the Navy? Well, one, I didn't want to do combat in Vietnam, ground combat anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to get a trade. My uncle was a master electrician, he had his own electrical company, and he had learned uh, his trade from in the Navy. He was a Navy electrician. And all my uncles were Navy. So it was just a, 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 something that I would be inclined to join. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted to join as an electrician. And the recruiter promised that he could get me into the CBs to become an electrician. However, when I got done with boot camp, I had orders for VTA school. And I said, what is a BT? And everybody started laughing. They said, well, you'll find out. And you know what's the best thing that ever happened to me? I learned my trade in the Navy. I'm a retired first class engineer from Massachusetts now. I've been 50 years in the boiler trade and I've loved every day of it. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. I, um, I, I joined and then I, I became an engineman. Um, out of a out of a school, um, well, I got out of boot camp, and then um, I was assigned to BTA school <laughs> <laughs> as an engine mechanic, and uh, called my father, and then he evidently called a senator or a congressman, and the next two days later, I got into engine A school, and. Um, I've basically been in the diesel trade for probably 15, 18 years of my 30 year civil service and then I became a project manager um, and uh, I still dabble in, in engines and, and repairs. Very cool. Um, do you guys have any interesting experiences from boot camp that you can recall? I gained 20 pounds in boot camp. Wow. The sign said you know, take all you want, but eat all you take, and I did. Um, my, I, when, I, when I came home, um, my grandmother looked at me, she said, they start to feed, eat. <laughs> That's I, what my what the grandmothers are you prone to do. Yeah. I, I stayed the same weight for probably 10 or 12 years, you know. Anything other, anything else stick out about boot camp, the moment? Boot camp? No. It. No, it was... 
I, I it mean, was I, interesting. It was a change for me. It, it, it was nothing. I mean, I, I um, spent uh, my youth and uh, BFW rifle drill team, so boot camp was there wasn't anything I wasn't used to already being yelled at. And, you know, uh, hmm. I already had the uh, uh, the practice of taking care of your gear down pat. I just had to learn an way to do it. But um, I think were interesting. Uh, I mean, we had a few a few guys decided they want to stay in the Navy after that and try to go over the fence, but they were caught shortly thereafter. Never saw them again. Mm. The biggest fear was not was washing out during a week of your training period. You didn't make that week. You were given a week to to try and make it up, and then you were sent back to a motivational company to <clears throat> motivate you to, to make it through boot camp and that could be that could put you back a month I mean I was the last of a 12 week boot camp yeah. when I graduated they got cut, cut back to eight weeks when you went was it eight weeks yeah, or 12? Ours, ours was eight weeks Years where did ago. you guys go yeah Great, Great, Lakes. Great, Lakes. Great Lakes yeah I went I was there from September until December and then back from <clears throat> January it's the coldest time in my life that I've ever been I never want to go back to the Great Lakes, even in the summertime. <laughs> um, I know you guys you told me what ship, and you already mentioned it, but um, how long were you both stationed on it again? In well, I was on it from May of 1971 through its decommissioning of September 30th, 1972. So uh, a little over a year and for myself. And I was on it for nine months, and then I got transferred to the USS Coronado LPD-11. And um, I stayed on that for three years okay. and then got out. Um, so you mentioned your rates, but what was your the highest rank that you both were on board? On board ship, I was a, a boiler technician, third class, or E4. On board the Warrington, I was an ENFN. On USS Coronado, I made it to E5, okay, second okay. class engineer. Um, what was the main job you had to do um, for that rate, and what did it entail? As second class engineman, I eventually ran the A gang shop along with another uh, second class engineman, and uh, we did hydraulics, um, electrical systems, air conditioning systems, uh, and emergency generators. Can you go back though and tell me what you also did on the the Warrington? On the, on the Warrington, um, I was in our division, and we repaired everything from water coolers to replacement of lights uh, to the 3268A uh, diesel generators that we maintained and, and one we ended up overhauling, uh, partial overhaul uh, just before pulling out mm -hmm. uh, for the world cruise which turned out to be uh, the Southeast Asia run. Wow. And how about uh, you? Uh, my assignment was the forward boiler room. Um, the space was equipped with uh, two Backpack and Wilcock modified M Express boilers with controlled superheat, uh, capable of the operating at 610 psi, with uh, making 100,000 pounds of steam an hour. Sent to the engine room where Mike would uh, use it to turn the throttles, to turn the turbines, to turn the, the, re the reductions here, to turn the propellers, turn the propellers on the boat, make it the boat go. Uh, uh, we did part of the maintenance of those units are water sites every 1800 hours of operation we would drain the boiler down crawl inside the steam and in the mud drum and use a air driven brush to clean the insides clean the of the tomb and then every 600 hours of steam we would shut the boilers down let them cool down crawl inside the fire boxes on both the fire side and the superheated side and scrape all the tubes down with a hand scraper to remove all the unburned carbon off those tubes. Wow. And uh, then we'd have our normal uh, maintenance of the steam driven um, pumps, uh, the bilge pump, the, the emergency feed water pump, the, uh, the electric and the steam driven and then the hand driven oil pumps, uh, the re re maintenance of the uh, force draft blowers for each of the different boiler, uh, boilers, you know, change out the lubricating oil, change out the bearings, uh, change out the steam pack glands, the carbon rings on the steam glands, the 
seals on the mm -hmm. shaft. Um, mm -hmm. We would we would pull out um, the the isolation valves, main stop on the boiler, the cross connect valves, uh, the auxiliary steam valves. Uh, we would repair uh, anything that was non welded. We would repair uh, uh, steam and water lines that were bolt and flange yeah. uh, connections. Welding was done by a certified Navy welder, if anything had to be done there. And that's usually done uh, in the yards. And I did go through a yard period uh, with the Warrington from, uh, I want to say, November of 71 to January of 72. It wasn't that Boston? The Boston Naval yeah. Shipyard. We had major repairs done to the boilers there. Wow, that's and, a lot. Uh, I, during that time, I was sent to firefighting school twice and damage control school uh, twice. Uh, and then when I got back aboard ship, my damage, my, my, my first uh, battle station was uh, Burnerman and boiler and boiler room number one on either one of the boilers. Um, when I got back from damage control school, I was assigned to repair five, which is the damage control um, group for engineering. Uh, I was made lead investigator, and um, that was my job the day we got hit in Vietnam. And we'll go into that a little bit later. Right. Yeah. Did you want to tell me a little bit, where was your battle station? My battle station was um, uh, after, after Hatch, which was a fire control station. Um, uh, my sea and anchor detail was after steering. Uh, we basically, with the generators and the, the 3268A and uh, diesel engines on the destroyer, uh, we basically, uh, we did every three months, we load tested. Uh, we ran them, we checked the oil. Um, there was an electrician that worked with us that did the control panels um, uh, on the USS Coronado, um, we did the same thing, load test every three months, check the oil, uh, run them, uh, usually monthly, mm. to make sure everything was up to par. Um, we did hydraulic systems on the USS Coronado, but on the Warrington, we basically did maintenance on water coolers, uh, water fountains. Um, light repairs, electrical repairs, uh, emergency generator running, maintenance. We did, just prior to us leaving for the Southeast Asian tour, uh, we did a head overhaul, um, which was removal of the three cylinder heads wow. and, and had them sent out to have them reworked. So as both of you were um, in the Navy during the Vietnam time, mm -hmm. um, when you were done with boot camp and you showed up on board ship, what was your first thought when you got to your ship? What did I get myself into? Uh, when I reported aboard ship, um, <coughs> I reported aboard, it signed in with the deck watch, and they sent down for one of the guys from the BT division, B division, and this pirate came walking out of the outer rear hatch door. He was in wore coveralls, he had a bandana on his head, he had a beard, and all you can see is the whites of his eyes because they were doing fire size on boiler number three in aft boiler room. And he said, and he was like, <laughs> fresh meat raw. Okay. Yeah, they, the Navy has a weird, very sick sense of humor, but you get used to it. And, you know, it's, it's the majority of the time, nothing is meant by it. It's all in, in good nature, ribbing and fun. Um, we would send, the deck gang would send down guys looking for, you know, 50 feet of perforated chow line or a bucket of steam. And I'd send my guys down to the uh, radio shack or the or sonar and ask them to find a set of fallopian tubes for the yardway water indicator. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, nickel and dime stuff. A lot of jokes. Yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of practical jokes. But, yeah. no, I mean. On the newer guys. Yes, on the newer guys. You couldn't do that. Well, they, everybody went through it. Everybody right. went through it. Mm -hmm. when you or, the first bucket, or the bucket of steam. Yeah, that was a good one. That was always a good one. You, you put the steam, you put the bucket under a steam vent. 
you open it up and just fill it up with steam and here you go. And you get to the, by the time you got from where you opened up the valve to where it was gone, you go, uh oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that's all I can give you, kid. You gotta explain it, you know, you guys, you know, that way. And what I was got, it like when you got on board? I got on board, uh, we were going on a world cruise. Yeah. You know, um, everybody on the ship told me we were going to Vietnam. I called my father. He said, no, you're not going to Vietnam. You're going on a world cruise. My mother thought it was great. Um, when we got out to the Atlantic, um, they decided to tell us, uh, Captain Chris Zerps um, told us that our itinerary had changed from, I think we were supposed to go to San Diego. Yeah, but um, we went, but which but we went like to Pearl. And then Guam and, and then, then Subic. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't figure that from Subic we were going to Vietnam. So when we pulled in, and um, I forget the the name of the destroyer that had the gun mount blown off. Oh, I know which one. You that's mean. that's when I found out we're going to Vietnam. Yeah. So, but. Were you a replacement ship for that ship? Is that what no, happened? No, no, no. I was in dry dock. Um, was it Higby? MIG, the Higby, yeah. USS Higby, got um, all of their people left the gun mount, and then a MIG hit the gun mount and blew the gun mount up, mm. luckily. They also found out that you can use an OBA as an underwater breathing apparatus. Right. Sit around there trying to, trying to you know, uh, get the leaks in the after steering. Uh, taking care of, that's it. You know, well, the thing with this, the, the joke about that is, you always taught in boot camp and through damage control school that when you are wearing your OBA and you have the full canister in, mm -hmm. it cannot get wet or oil on it because it will explode. Or the guys are down in water up to their chest with an OBA on because of toxic films right. and it, they're fine. They were okay, fine. Somebody lied to us, you know. Yeah. Where was your birthing area? My birthing area was next to uh, the uh, machine shop, right across from the machine shop where the emergency generator was. And, um, you were in the M and B uh, M and B M, M, yeah. M, M and B divisions were birthed in the right. same spot, which we can show you later on if you. That's well, actually, that's where they're working right now. They're uh, we're doing a deck in there. That's where my rack was. Um, third row back, middle rack, from the, where the machine shop door was. Right, and yeah. I was right across from the machine shop door, top rack. So the next question, you guys, this is probably where you can bring in your Vietnam experience. Um, relay any interesting story about your time on board ship. We loaded a lot of ammo. Yes. <laughs> we, we did well. Did, we were going, we, we, had, had, we, 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 we had done a, a, a series of, of turns and we wound up in Saigon for mm -hmm. a 24-hour period. Right. Now, the funny thing about being in Saigon, you have... Marines walking along the, out the oh. passageway, dropping grenades over the over the side of the boat. You know, every 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going, "Why are they doing that?" And the, the chief explained to me, "Well, there's there's swimmers out there that would like to put a, a sassel charge alongside the boat and blow it up." Well, okay, I'm going back on the boat. You know? <laughs> so uh, after that, we went out. Uh, well, we were in the Nang, yeah. and then we went up to Quang Tri. Right. But on Not the way up, right. But on the way up there, that's when we, that's when we rearmed, right, off by Hilo. All right, these guys are flying <clears throat> racks of five-inch rounds and powder casings, right. and they're the and, and the and the uh, cargo nets or, or uh, containers come down, and it's like th three feet off the off the deck when they cut the line, and it goes bam, and you go, uh, okay, there's like fifty rounds of five-inch thirty-eight explosive high right. explosives right there. Yeah, that's a fun idea. Yeah, so and then we spent the the day just handling rounds. We 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 took on Light, so much ammo that day that we had rounds in the the chief's birthing compartment. We had we had rounds in B, in the, the deck division birthing spaces. Right. The, am, the 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 ammo lockers were completely mm. full. Yep. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I want to say it was against naval policy to have <coughs> that much on board. But well, I think somebody miscalculated. Yeah, we had some up on the hill, hill hanger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, and then, well, remember going over on the Detroit? We were we were steaming from uh, to Panama to Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, and we were taking on we were the, the ships that we were with 
we were taking, we were coming alongside the USS uh, Barcelona was one of them. But, but yes, but the the uh, uh, AOE was the remember. was the Detroit out of Bentonville. Okay. Okay. Um, the we ship, were that convoy. Uh, right. The ship up in front of us. You heard the sirens going off, and there was a, and there was an emergency breakaway. We found out later on that afternoon uh, that a uh, cable that was attached to the fuel hose had snapped and went back across mm -hmm. the, the distance and decapitated a crewman on the mm -hmm. on the Detroit. Wow. So, uh, could you? Uh, First, we'll start with Joe, if that's okay, and then go right to Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is one of the more important Warrington stories. Can you tell us a little bit about leaving the gun line off Vietnam and the circumstances that led to the mine and what happened on that cruise back? If we could start with, from your personal experiences and memories, uh, Joe, if we could start with you, and then Mike, if well, you could answer from your perspective. Um, where you were, or what, what the ship was. and I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly the position of the ship. I know we were at... Um, Zebra, and we went to X-ray, and uh, I'm not. Sure, we were getting ready to do. I think we were going to do a gun shoot, um, and we relaxed GQ and went to lunch. Had lunch, and I was back up in the oil lab around one o'clock in the afternoon, getting ready to do a, a test on an oil sample that I had taken earlier that morning. And the next thing, the walls just closed in. Yep. Everything. Everything just went. Boom and, and out again the con from concussion. Every piece of glass that was in in the room just shattered. And okay, I stumbled out, uh, shook my head. I went out the hatchway to see what was going on. And the next thing I know, I've got this pant pulling me on the back of my shirt and yelling at me, "Get back in here!" It turned out to be the BT chief. So and then I just. I just uh, you know, the alarms were going off, battle stations. I ran to repair five and got my gear on. And I just went and waited for, uh, you know, uh, D uh, DC Central to send me to what, what was going on. I mean, you could hear the guys screaming all over the place. I mean, I could hear the stuff on, on the sound power phones uh, as to, you know, flooding in the main control, you know, flooding in and after boiler room, flooding in after engine room. I'm going, uh, we had a We had an eight-foot rip. Yeah. Oh, um, port side. Yeah. So my my first assignment. Ten foot down. Yeah. My my first <clears throat> assignment was to investigate uh, main control. Okay. I got the report from all the, from the, the the petty officers down there, the, the senior petty officer down there. I relayed that back to damage control. Then I went down to forward boiler room. I looked at forward boil, uh, at boiler number one. I'm going. This does not look good because boiler number one was the boiler rotten line, and it was at zero pressure. And uh, well, this isn't good, but you know, we had minor flooding in, in B1. I went back to, uh, to B3 um, after uh, boiler room, and that was a total disaster. Yeah. Number three boiler had been mocked, knocked, knocked off her pedestal. You could see the boiler had actually well, moved. There were also the the fire brick that was blown out. Right, yeah, that's part of it. That I right. didn't know about that. Right. All, I, right. all I saw was that boiler hanging there, right. and I saw the main steam line sag. Okay, now the 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 the, the most scariest thing that can happen to a boiler technician or or a machinist mate is if the main steam line develops a leak, severs, it severs. If it breaks. You have 10 seconds to evacuate that space, and nobody in, has ever been able to do it. We practice, you train, you run, you never, you'll, you will never escape the steam. That's what happened on the Bastille when she blew up her foil the boiler room. All those guys were dead within 15 seconds. And that happened in 1973, but that's a, another story. Yeah. So I, and then I got back down to the, the after engine room, same thing. Got down in, in the after steering, and uh, I had my DC bag with me and a couple of my guys. crew. We made some repairs down there to keep the... The leaks down. We went down underneath uh, the engine mm -hmm. and in the apartment. We we uh, <coughs> excuse me. We uh, repaired the leaks, the water leaks down there. And we stopped them just the way we were trained to go to school. And you know, when I told the guys, so uh, I said, "Look, uh, close the hatch. Leave the lab battle on. Let me fix it. If you don't hear me rapping on this, then don't don't come looking for me because I can't stop the leaks." Fortunately, <clears throat> I got out. Uh, and then after that, I was just going and doing whatever I was sent to do. Uh, I remember saying uh, people were yelling for um, DC. 
uh, in the after birthing space, which was Mount 53. I'm going to go around, and I looked in there, and I'm going, what's the story? Well, there was a five-inch uh, round that they couldn't tell if the timer on it, the fuse timer was at zero or was off the mark. Uh, being a stupid guy, I grabbed it. I made a hole up, got up uh, of the hatch, went up the ladder, went up the upper hatch, and threw it over the side. And I said, okay, this is it. i got to go change my shorts. <laughs> I know, really, I did have to go change my shirts because I had, I had wet myself. Right. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I turned around to go back in, and the next thing you know, everybody's just passing rounds to me and tossing them over the side. And then the word came down from the bridge to stop throwing shells, you know, over the side. And then the rest of that day was just working with, uh, with Mike and the other guys I knew, getting uh, P250 pumps, pumps. In, either you know into the main engine room, into the after engine room, just to right. try to keep the flooding water under control. One of the guys from main control, third class, um, I think he was, I think he he was out of New York, had just got his certification as a scuba diver. Excuse me. Before we left Newport, he had his gear on board. And what he did, he got scooted up, he went over the side and stuffed mattresses into the side of the, the hole. <coughs> Fell down the leaks. And then, you know, we shorted up with uh, timber and pilings that we had aboard ship to try and slow it down, you know, maintain, um, you know, stability of the boat that way. We were number, we were able to keep uh, after engine room going for at least another 15 or 20 minutes when the steam uh, drew down off the board. So we were able to steam out of the area. And then uh, the Robeson uh, DDG-12 out of San Diego came alongside, put a tow rope on us and towed us out uh, further away from the area. Uh, and then she towed us for a day, I think full day. And then we picked up yeah, an ocean. We, she towed us through the evening. Yeah. And then and we did, into, into the morning. Yeah, and then we picked up an ocean going tug the next morning which towed us from some point in the middle of the ocean back to Subic Bay, which took us about seven days. Yeah. Seven well, we were towed by two uh, ocean-going tugs. Okay. I only remember the so, one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, one you know out what? of the Nang. Yeah. Um, Taya Coney, I believe, and then um, the one from Subic Bay picked us up and relieved the yeah. Taya Coney. Yeah, we, we broke it. We lost the tow rope. The first we, out. Yeah, the Robeson, uh, they used mooring lines to tow us, and they kept on breaking. Mm. Um, so, so, Mike, since we're going into this, can you okay. phase in a little bit uh, what your yep. memory is from the beginning of wearing to coming off the gun line, and what you, where yep. you were, and what you remember? To um, I know we, we left the Nang, and we went north um, to somewhere around the Quantry um, Islands, and... Um, uh, I believe in the morning uh, we were fired on and we evaded uh, gunfire and then um, I went down for watch around uh, 12 o'clock um, and uh, I was on throttles it was my second uh, watch they were breaking me in and um, somewhere around 1 1 15 um, all hell broke loose uh, the deck plates came up um, steam pipes went past my head and um, I believe I was knocked out. Somebody woke me up. Uh, the the uh, emergency lights were on. Um, I was told that, that at that point in time after engine room shut down. Um, uh, I was told, I was given a broom, told to wave it in front of me in case any of the uh, steam lines were broken went up to my um, uh, station, the fire station, uh, mm -hmm. where we, we uh, basically had training on DC plugs to put into, you know, the, the hull from the inside mm -hmm. uh, to stop the water. Um, then uh, we were told, um, uh, Jerry Al Lieutenant J.G. Yeah. Jerry Oliver came around and he said, we've, we've been hit, um, after engine room is flooding out, guys came out from after engine room screaming, we're sinking. And um, 
that's when we, I think we had two or three, maybe four P250 pumps that we started to, to set up yeah. and drop yeah. lines down into after engine room. I'm not sure what happened with forward, but um, I remember fueling for, for days um, on, on two or three, maybe four hours, and then slept for four, and then getting woken up again. Robeson pulled up beside us just after we got out under our own power. I thought it was forward engine room that got us out, um, but I'm, could, I'm, yeah, not, yeah, I'm not 100% well, well, yeah, sure. Well, forward after engine room, I heard was shut down. Well, forward forward boiler room still had an operating boiler. Didn't right. look good, but right. it still had an operating so boiler. So we got out so on one shaft. So control with one shaft. Right. Yeah, right. And um, uh, I know I, I believe we had a total of possibly nine P two fifty pumps. Um, I know we didn't have restrooms for probably a day or two until they got the one P two fifty pump hooked up to the restrooms. Um, we, our, our food back, from what I can remember, was tuna and chicken out of the can and water. No, I the, hear plums, but... <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, no. Everything that was in the reefers that we could get our hands I, on. I, yeah, I'm... I'm all right? I'm, no, I'm not I saying... I never got that, steaks. That, 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 <laughs> it was, that it was authorized, all right? Yeah. But I, I, I can attest to the fact that, yes, I did have a steak, and I had a couple of lobsters that evening. Uh, and we did go to tuna fish. I had still, I had a half a dozen cans of Spam in my locker that I shared with my friends, my close friends. So, Spam is... Still, very good favorite food of mine to this day. So. You combat. I think that that, yeah, that, that is. That, that, I think we do. That yeah. qualifies. Yeah. Uh, did you, well, do you have another story, combat story you want to share? I mean, of course. Um. Well, no, that was a bar fight. That's not combat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a combat zone. <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh, well, the thing with it was, uh, we got back to the Philippines. They put us into a floating dry dock. We offloaded uh, ammo and fuel that night. This, the both of space probably well, got off. But, still, huh? But, still had ammo on board? Oh, yeah. Well, because we, you said you we, were we trying to offload ammo it. When we, when we were towed back, the Robeson saw us come out of the water, saw the propellers come out of the water. <coughs> we were towed back, um, uh, and uh, the, the two tugs picked us up, towed us, and then... Um, we were pulled up to the nitro where we offloaded ammo and fuel. Then we were towed into dry dock, and uh, yeah. then we saw the damages. Yeah, because the day before we got hit, I was, we had refueled or rearmed. I had three hundred thousand gallons of oh. fuel oil on board, and it and when we got hit, the midships and the after storage tanks for the oil sort of became. One. Cheese cloth. I mean, they were the water. We was, had crack tanks. We, 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 we I didn't Fresh know water and oil. fuel. I didn't know where oil. where the oil was. In so, fact, we had. I had ten thousand gallons of JP five on board. I couldn't well, find it. I remember looking down into our compartments, and water and fuel oil covered oh whatever our foot lockers. So what I had on, was I wore on. for seven or eight days wow. um, and we all smelled yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah you became acclimated to it yeah right? well the, the cold salt water showers were terrible yeah i know i'd rather stink you know <laughs> yeah it's gone down what do you recall about is there any crew stories or tell me about the crew what's it like to be part of that crew camaraderie was great um, I'm still in touch with a number of guys. Uh, we've lost some of our guys due to Agent Orange uh, because of the evaporators right. and yeah. drinking Agent Orange and cooking with it and showering with it. Um, the evaporators pull the salt out. Um, chemical it doesn't touch. Chem no. mm. So uh, um, I've got diabetes. Joe's got diabetes. Um, 
But how's the crew on the, in regards to your crew and the professionalism of them, especially during that situation? How, right. how we, was the Warrington a great crew? Would you we say? were, uh, yeah, we, we, we were all brothers. The same. You know, you know, the, we you, were you were trying to save the boat. All right, mm -hmm. you're trying to keep your buddies from drowning or dying. Mm -hmm. You know, the boat. The hell with the boat. The boat. The boat will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Which you know. When's the last time you two saw each other? Because you were on the 45. same. Forty-five. Forty-five years ago. Yeah, so this is the first time ago. you guys have physically seen each other yes, since you have to wear We've been yeah. together on Facebook. On Facebook. So you basically talk. have gone gearing class to gearing class in your meetups now. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. yes. Oh, glad to see you together. That's great. Um, I have a number of my friends. I, I talk weekly to my boss, uh, Richard Mon. Uh, he was a second class. Um, my, my partners, um, Frank Gorman, who was, he was called Crawdad. Um, we all had nicknames. Uh, I talked to them, Gene Server. Um, I talked to him every couple of months. I'm in touch with his wife, Mary. Uh, my wife, Beth. We're we're so close knit crew. We're 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 a family. Um, I've been in the Warrington group since 2007 or eight. Um, I've got close friends that were on the Warrington in 1959, 1957. I just lost Ken Drew. Um, he was on in 58. Um, he just passed away from COVID. No, sorry um, to hear that. You, um, you had to develop a familiarity with a lot of people, but you were selective in the ones who you were close to. All right. You had to know who you could trust in a bad situation, who had your back, you know, and who and you, you wanted to stay we, away from. You guys lived through a bad situation. We, Were you we right lived, in the choices that you made of your friends? And we lived in, and, and from, from what I feel, we are all brothers. Huh. Um, it didn't matter if you were a cook, you know, uh, bosses, religion, space, or, it didn't matter. we had black guys, yeah. we had, you know, I mean, I'm Jewish, Joe's not. Um, doesn't matter know, to me. We're brothers. Yeah. Take care of one another. Yeah. Uh, many uh, believe serving on a destroyer is a special thing. What are your thoughts about serving on a Navy destroyer? I see only way Com go. Completely different. Um, my LPD friends seem very cold. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I mean. Frank Gorman, I'm in touch with. Uh, Gene Serber, he's down in Kentucky. We're going to be seeing him soon. Um, hey, when I when when the uh, Warrington was decommissioned, um, my orders were to uh, return back to Newport, Rhode Island, where I picked up an airing, another Gearing class destroyer, the William R. Rush DD714. So I I was it, you know. It was just like going home again. All right, I knew the boat. I knew where it was going to be. That was assigned, assigned back to boiler room number one. So I knew the systems, and the guys were friendly. They were amazed that um, we got hit, and I came back. They wanted, wanted to know, you know, oh, you're a hero. No, 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 no. I just, I, the, here, guys, here's the situation. When, I couldn't swim 100 miles south to get back behind the DMZ, and I can't walk on water. So I had to do one or two things: either keep the boat afloat. Or find a way to get off it real fast. <laughs> when uh, when Noel Petrie gave us the word yeah. that the Warrington was going to be decommissioned, I personally felt like I was being evicted. Yep. You know, um, I didn't well, know where I was going. So you guys went into repair, right? We went we, into no, dry dock. We to, went to dry dock, and, and what they did, what they call an in-serve, an in-service in inspection. inspection. So admirals from. From throughout the fleet, their specialties mm -hmm. in metallurgy and weapon systems, ship design, architecture, mm -hmm. come in and they inspected the boat from stern, stern, stern to the bow, right. right? All below, the, you know, all the voids, all, all the right. cracks, and everything. And they made a determination that the damn battle damage was too severe to warrant repairs. So, so well, the, well the, the force of the MK third, I believe they were MK thirty sixes yeah, or thirty twos. I'm not sure. One, one of them was converted, they were converted to magnetic, and from Haiphong Harbor to the DMZ, they were placed along the shoreline. Um, the impact 
we we couldn't understand why you know they they wouldn't just repair the ship and send it out, mm -hmm. but the force of the the 500 pound um, TNT um, force blew electrical lines, blew hydraulic lines, blew water lines as it's you know much. it went off. Uh, we were blown out of the water 40 feet according to the Robeson. Uh, they saw the propellers, which is a total of 70 feet. From bottom of the propeller to when we were blown right. out of the water. And um, threw us around like we were a tin can. The second you know? that, that second afternoon, <laughs> when we took that 44 degree roll? Oh, on, on the way back was... was I mean, I didn't get seasick, but um, we rocked and rolled. We almost lost guys over in the tow? side. In tow? Yeah. Well, the, you're, you're, you're going maybe a knot this way, and the, this, the waves are pushing you back and forth yeah. this way. The Robeson probably towed us four to seven knots wow. in the sea. Mm -hmm. We were rocking and rolling. Uh, um, when the Tyacone towed us, we probably went up to like 10, 11 knots, but still you're in rough seas. Um, we were we were moving. Yeah, I was on I was on the port side deck, grabbing a cigarette, and I, and I felt the boat going over. It went as far to where I'm I'm hanging on to the railing, and I could reach out. My feet are getting when I can reach out and tap tap the top of the water. That's how much the boat had leaned over. Now we, we were rolling because usually. Um, I, I guess the knottage is probably 25 to 30 knots. Yeah. Um, we, we were towed a maximum of maybe 10 knots in rough seas. Wow. Uh, now, from what I understand, because I've looked it up on WikiLeaks and stuff like that, that the, that the design for that destroyer, it, that it could take a 46 and a half degree roll without capsizing. And I swear to God, we were at a 44 degree we, roll that afternoon. We were rolling. We wow. were rolling. So, um, how did your service and experience affect your lives? For me, it was great. I mean, I'm... Right. You mentioned you've been able to go on and... Uh, yeah, and well, yeah, well uh, there's a couple things that had happened. Um, in the spring of 1973, I got sick. I was sent over to Newport Hospital, and they shipped me up to Chelsea Naval Hospital. Uh, Chelsea Naval was open at the time. And... I was there a couple of days and I was being looked at by doctors and then this guy came in with more gold on his shoulders that I thought ever could, could exist. Turns out he used to be the, the he was the doctor to, uh, for uh, President Johnson. He was the head of the hospital. And his first question to me was, hey son, how did you get in the Navy being a diabetic? And I passed out. Because at that point in my time, I was looking to do anything that I could to advance in the Navy. Uh, the Navy was going to be my career after Vietnam. I wanted the Navy. I mean, I was going to be. I wanted to be an officer. You know, I didn't want to be in the boiler room anymore. I want to tell the guys in the boiler room what to do. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to become an officer. I had signed. I was getting ready to sign up for a six-year reenlistment. I just got done talking with the uh, career counselor in February. And with the paperwork was all done, I was going to get my $10,000 bonus, which was a big deal at the time, sign over for six years, and then enlist in the, re -enlist in the STAR program, which at that point in time, the Navy would prep you, send you to college prep school to take your college boards. Okay, depending on the college boards, they would send you to an engineering school. Okay, not a bad deal. And I figured it all out. By the time I graduated, I mean, during uh, breaks in school, summer or winter, I would go back aboard ship or wherever the Navy wanted me because I would still be active Navy. Uh, I'd still be able to go for writ examinations if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I got done and graduated and in a, uh, sworn in as an ensign, my base pay would be the same as the lieutenant commanders for my time in service. Mm -hmm. I'm going, yeah. And then you found out. And then I found out I was a diabetic. I was medically discharged uh, from the Navy in September of 1973. Um, and then I went into civilian practice as a licensed boiler operator in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, I couldn't be happier. 
I'm um, working with boilers. Is, they, you know, they, they they were my first love when I went in the Navy. They still are. Um, now, after 50 years, um, I'm a first class engineer, the highest license you can hold. I hold a, a number of licenses as a boiler engineer, both nationally and internationally. Uh, I have a halfway decent reputation, so you know I'm happy. So it did and a lot for you then, huh? The, 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 look, I'm very I am very grateful for the Navy. It, it gave me a good solid foundation in the line of work that I eventually went into. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for my friends having pity on me and showing me how to do my job the right way, <laughs> you know, um, I, I probably wouldn't have made much of myself. But I, I had, the Navy was very, very good to me. Very good yep. to me. And how the, about Na you? the Navy uh, gave me uh, technical training in diesel repair and generator repair, which, um, I got out of the Navy after four years and worked at a carburetor plant, worked from a carburetor builder to a second, uh, first step supervisor, and then I really wasn't getting very far financially with that, and um, I started my civil service career with uh, Department of Transportation, U.S. Coast Guard, Curtis Bay, Maryland. Um, Worked there for four years uh, in the cold, in dry docks and steel toe shoes and freezing mm -hmm. off my toes. Mm -hmm. And then they were having a riff. Uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski uh, fought for us and I transferred and worked for Fort Meade Department of Defense, U.S. Army for four years. Um, didn't get very far as far as the supervisor position uh, and then worked for DOD for 21, well I worked for GSA one year and 20 years for uh, Department of Defense. I really can't go into my clearance and all, okay. but um, um, I retired in 2008 after 37.6 uh, years and I've been retired ever since, and now I'm working for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and grandchildren. <laughs> um, would you guys do it all again if you could? Oh, hell and yeah. In a minute. In a minute. Oh, um, I'm, it, I'm waiting for that phone call. And so is it my wife. She's got my bags packed. <laughs> okay. Um, why do you think it's important to preserve museum uh, ships for posterity? To let the public know that we were in the military and these things kept everybody free um, although we went to places that we really didn't want to go yeah, well, yeah. but um, it's part of the bar. you know yeah. that's, that's now, it, it's, what, what everybody should do I, I feel that when you get out of high school you should have a mandatory two or three years in the military to you know <laughs> you grow up and you learn to live on your own um, I think they, it ought to, it should be mandatory. What do you think That's the news? That's personally my right. opinion. I agree with you, by the way. <laughs> a lot of people do. A lot of people have well, the same thing. But what do you think about them being able to come to the Kennedy well, today? It's, it's, it's very important, all right, it's for them, to, for them to be able to put their hands on and touch something that their grandfathers, their fathers, their brothers, their sisters actually lived and maybe died on. All right, it, it, it's like Gettysburg. All right, the battle's done, everybody's dead. But it's a very part, important part of our American culture. This is part of our American culture. I mean, the, the, look, I'm not saying the Navy's or the government's always right, all right? But this was our lives. We wrote the check for them to cash. I want everybody to know right. this is what yep. we did, and this is how we did it, and this is why we did it. It's I've, important I've, been on the, I've been on the renovation crew for a year and a half, and um, I love it. You know, I travel from Baltimore to here. Sometimes I drive. I'm not sure if I'm going to drive again, but uh, flying is a lot easier. And then renting a car, and, you know, my wife is here, and uh, we're having a good time.